Hi everybody, it's Susan here from Cancer Research Demystified. Welcome back. I'm here without Haley today, I'm afraid it's just me. And the question that I'm going to address in this video is how much does cancer research cost? This is a question we actually get quite a lot from cancer patients. I think it's really good to actually know how much this stuff costs, especially if you're fundraising for cancer research and your pub quiz raises a few hundred pounds. Well, where can that go? But firstly, let's address the elephant in the room. This video looks an awful lot different to our normal ones, doesn't it? And that's because we are not coming to you from our office in University College London, where we normally film on a Tuesday night. We are not coming to you from the hospital where we normally collect patients Examples for our cancer research from clinical trials or clinical studies. I'm afraid we're not there either. Because like a lot of you, we are not essential workers and so we have been working from home for the last couple of months. So I'm coming to you here from my little apartment in London where I'm recording this completely new style of video, so please bear with me. So in terms of those costs, of cancer research. Well, I'm gonna give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the most important things that we need some money for. Uh, firstly, tools and equipment in the lab, obviously those can be quite expensive. What about chemicals and reagents? Some are cheap, some expensive. We do also, of course, need money for our own salaries and for stipends for our students so that we can pay our rent and get some food. And at the end of the video, I'll broadly let you know how much a whole PhD or project, including absolutely everything, is likely to cost. So firstly, in terms of those tools and equipment, well, we have to start with the pets because those are absolutely essential for any lab-based cancer researcher. They're about as well used as a computer would be for an office worker. These are what are in our hands all day, every day. And for a set of pipettes that you might have yourself or you might share with your lab mates, that would cost a few hundred pounds, depending on the brand. Then for small equipment, most labs would have at least a half a dozen pieces of little equipment, things that sit on top of the bench, like smaller centrifuges, shakers, rollers, things that heat or cool things, that sort of thing. And those will cost a few thousand pounds each. More specialised equipment and more expensive equipment will usually have a couple of pieces of these in each lab or you might have to go to another lab within your building, maybe on a different floor to borrow one of these pieces, or, well to go to one of these pieces of equipment to use. An example of that would be something like a PCR machine, which is what's been in the news an awful lot lately because that's what they use to test for coronavirus. But then for those cutting edge pieces of equipment, these are the things that you might need to travel to another city or even another country to get access to. And those can cost hundreds of thousands of pounds or even millions. And you're a very lucky scientist if you have access to some of those. So then in order to run our experiments that require these pieces of equipment, we usually have a list of ingredients, a little bit like if you're cooking or baking. And these can be liquids or solid powders, tablets, those kind of things. And some of them can be very, very cheap. So simple, simple chemicals like bottles of buffer can cost pennies to pounds. Most experiments will also include one or two more expensive things. These might be antibodies or probes. These can cost a couple of hundred pounds each, again, depending on how uh, specialized they are. Then for certain special experiments that we work towards and really get excited about and look forward to, we might use really custom designed molecular products that we order ahead from a company. And those can cost a good bit more money, maybe somewhere in the range of thousands. So now that we've got all our equipment and chemicals covered, it's time for salaries. And it probably won't surprise you to know that scientists don't get particularly high salaries. We're, we're not generally getting six figure salaries if we're working away on cancer research in a university. But we do, of course, have to pay salaries for our scientists. We are not volunteers. These are highly qualified individuals who have PhDs, several degrees, awards, that kind of thing. And the salary for a cancer researcher, it does vary a lot across the world. But an example would be from the UK. If you've already got your PhD, then you'll be working in a role called a postdoc position. And the gross salary for that would usually be about 35 to 45,000 pounds a year. Now, if you're planning a project where you hire one of these postdocs, you're actually going to have to pay overhead on top of that to the university so that they can keep the heating and lights on and support staff and stuff. That brings it up to about 50,000 pounds. 
Okay, you're probably saying you're throwing too many numbers at me, what's going on? Give me the big picture. So that's actually easy enough to do because we do budget our projects ahead of time. So I can give you an example of a PhD. This would normally take a student about three or four years to complete and the full project, including all of the lab stuff, the student stipend, all of those kind of ancillary costs, generally be somewhere between one and 200,000 pounds. And an example of my own PhD, uh, mine cost about 120,000. So for a postdoc, it costs a little bit more. Postdocs are fully qualified, so they generally demand a proper salary. And that's where those overheads to the university really come in and there's some extra costs around that as well. So you're talking about three to 400,000 for a full project that takes a few years to complete. And an example, my fellowship cost of just over 300,000 pounds for three years. So that's a lot of money involved. So we've got to ask ourselves who pays? Well, very broadly speaking, funding can come either from the government or from outside of the government. Government funding would be like research councils, those kind of things, generally competitively awarded. So scientists would write up a project plan and then go to one of these funding bodies and say, you know, this is what we want to do, please fund us to do it. The process is roughly the same for non-government funding, it's just that the money is coming from a different place, so it might be one of the big charities that you've heard of, it might be an, uh, another charitable foundation where they don't actually fundraise money, but that they kind of build up their own investments and then fund research out of that. It could be individual philanthropists or even pharmaceutical companies will sometimes fund research within universities. So no matter where your funding is coming from, it is generally competitively awarded. So you have to have a really clear and detailed project plan and budget in place beforehand, before it even starts. And that's why I'm able to tell you, well, this is how much a full project costs because I've costed for these kinds of projects myself in the past. So that brings us to the end of our video. It's the first time that I've recorded one like this. I do feel a little bit like I'm giving a lecture because I don't have Haley standing next to me. I'm not in the lab and I don't have things to show you. I know it's not as fun when we're not in the lab environment. So please be brutally honest. Let us know what did you think? Was this worth watching? Would you prefer we just take a break until we're back in the lab? Or do you want to see more of these? Let us know. Thank you and see you next time.